Okay, Be'ezat Hashem, Na'ase Ve'Natzliach. I'd like to welcome everybody to Chilling with Torah, uh, Sunday night at David Chai Synagogue. This week's parasha is Parashat Tazria Metzora, a double header. I want to give, before we get started, an honorable mention to our uh, uh, great sponsors. We have Anonymous doing this every single week. Be'ezat Hashem, that he have a lot of atzachah, b'chom ha'asei adav. And we also have uh, Miss uh, Dina Dornbush, who's doing this in honor of her daughter, Shayna Badina, that she'll have an easy labor. Mm-hmm. And for Adat Sahab, her son, Yosef uh, Dornbush, um, uh, that you have Bachab Atzacha in his uh, upcoming wedding. And may this also be to the newborn baby of Baby Citron, as well as Mazal Tov, yeah. And to the easy labor of Simcha Bachula. And uh, wait, 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 wait. What month do you see Halfway. Then what? Uh, easy pregnancy. Yeah. Okay. And to the Rufua Shulav, David Ben Zohar. Talking about that more on this, but you know that it should go well. Whatever you pregnancy, it should go well. Okay. So this week's parasha is parasha Tazria. So. Last week, the parasha dealt with, parasha Shemini dealt with the death of Nadav and Avihu. The Mishkan and, uh, and the Korbanot that were brought on the first uh, of um, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Mm-hmm. And then we had the, the, the list of kosher animals and non-kosher animals. Mm-hmm. By the way, quick question about last week. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu actually pointed to the animal and showed it to them. So the quick question is, how did all those animals show up in the desert? How was Moshe Rabbeinu able to show them a penguin or a bear? Winter animals. Why are you able to show them a tiger or a lion? Uh, you know, most of the time the desert is a place just for sn- uh, snakes camels. and scorpions and maybe some camels. Those are the, some of the few animals that can withstand that weather. What are they doing in the desert? How can he point to an eagle? How can he point to a, uh, to, to a kosher animal and to a non-kosher animal in the desert? How did they get there? How did they get there? Miracles. Miracles of miracles. But how? A few opinions. The rabbi said just like the same way that for, uh, um, for Noah, they said two by two came to the came to the boat. Moshe Rabbeinu lo iskeleze himself that him, the great leader of Am Yisrael, is not going to merit to have animals come to show them what's kosher and what's not kosher. And then I heard a second opinion of that these. I don't know about the fish. I know about the animals. Is that some of the animals are the animals that hung out after Yitzia, after Mitzrayim, in the Makat Dever. There was a multitude of uh, mixed animals, and the animals that were used during that makkah were also the animals that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu used as an example for what's kosher and what's not kosher. I thought that was very interesting. But the only reason why I'm bringing it up is why right after they talk about kosher animals and non-kosher animals, we talk about on Parashat Tazria, on Ishaki Tazria ve'al Dazachar. What's the connection? What's the connection between a pregnant woman that gives birth to a child to the kosher animals in the previous chap- uh, in the previous parasha? So Rashi tells us right there in the beginning, if you read the first Rashi, it says, Amar Rabbi Semali, Keshem Shitzirato Shel Adam, Achar Kol Behema Chaya Ve'of Pemase Bereshit, Kach Torato Nit Pasha, Achar Torat Behema Chaya Ve'of, the same way that in the six days of creation, there was first the animals, then the human beings. So it's uh, similarly over here, we bring in the same order. However, I heard, uh, I read a different pirush that says that a person, you know, we over here, Tazriya Metzora. We talk about a person, Shemotzi Shem Ra. A person who gets to the point where he's talking, the Shona Ra about another person. And they say that it's worthy to bring up a, a mosquito and a worm and a bird first before you can mention him. So they said that the reason that they brought the animals first is because if he's not worthy, some, a person who is Metzora is not worthy to get mentioned before. Furthermore, 
we have over here the first part of Tazria. It says, Ki Tazria ve'alda zachar. And she is instruct a woman that is gets pregnant and has a child. At the end, she's instructed to bring a korban. What is the korban that she brings? Shne mm. bnei yona. Echad leola vechad lechatat. Why would that be her offering? Why would a woman bring two birds? Where's the last time we saw, where's another place where we see that you bring a bird as an offering? Um. Where else? Exactly. The Zriah and Metzorah have the same korbanot. What's the Metzorah? They have the, they have the same korbanot. They both bring a yonah. The woman brings it because what? One is for khatat and one is la'olam. What's for khatat? One is because she brings things that she became a mother. She, she has, a, she, she has a, a family. It's a thanks offering, olam. Khatat, because while she was going through the, uh, the child, the... It's kind of like hard. What? It's kind of hard. While she was going through the delivery, she was... Promising that she's never gonna do it again. She wasn't thinking she wasn't thinking so highly of her husband, so she said because she she said those things, she has to bring a Koban Khatat. The, the next place that we see it is the person that speaks a Shon Hara. What's the reason that he brings two birds? One is for the Shon Hara that he came that he spoke. That's to atone for that. The second one is we let that bird go. We let it fly. Why do we let it fly? Because the same way he had the opportunity to not say Lashon Hara, and he didn't do it, is the same thing that we show him the bird. He had the opportunity to let the Lashon Hara go, and we let the bird go. Very interesting, two things why we bring the Yonah. One last thing that I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to the boys in the class to see if you guys can uh, add a Chidush. It says that Amotzi... Lashon Ra, someone who talks Lashon Hara, the process goes that the the, the nega, the, the tzarat goes where? Where did, how does it travel? Where does it start first? Starts in his house. After that it goes to the furniture. After the furniture, the clothes, and then after that it goes to the skin. So imagine this. Imagine all of a sudden. You're sitting in your house in the living room, and all of a sudden, right by the dining table, there's a green spot. And then you're, and you know that it's something to do with the Lashon Hara you spoke. And you don't do anything about it. And all of a sudden, that beautiful leather couch that you have, right on the left seat, there's another green spot. So now you have one on the wall and one on the couch. And you still don't do anything about it. And imagine all of a sudden this beautiful white suit that you're wearing has a huge green spot right in the middle. And you still don't do anything about it. And then it goes on your body. Mamash, you have it all over your arm, or all over your uh, hair or your skull. And you still don't do anything about it. What would make a person ignore all those signs? Why would a person go through all this... Why would Hashem have all this hasadim with a, with a human being where He gives him privately in the house where nobody can see? He, he escalates it and shows him, listen, it's in the house, now it's on the, it's on the couch where you're sitting, you're not doing anything, you're just sitting down. Get up, do teshuvah. He doesn't do teshuvah, he's walking around. Instead of going around to walk to do teshuvah, he's walking around with the tzarat on his, uh, on his clothes. Then it goes to his body and still he doesn't, till it gets to the point that he has to go see the Kohen. Why would he neglect it for so long? What, would, uh, what do you think is the reason for that? He's saying that the Lashon is not in Teshuvah, but when he substitutes his Lashon to his Yetzer Hara, he's not in Dut Teshuvah. The is that before it gets to him, it's going to also get to his house and to all the walls. He's going to tear down his house. He's going to lose his house and still he, he doesn't do chuvah. So yeah, that's a good point. What is it? What would make a person get to that point 
to the point that he doesn't have to do it, that he eventually has to go and see a Kohen? What happened? How do you, how do you like not stop it in the first signal? So, we, we can't judge the, the, the Jews before us that they were on such a high level, but we can say that today, for ourselves, sometimes we speak Lashon Hara, or we speak Motzi Lashon Hara about somebody, and we're not supposed to do it. But we're so blinded, we so don't see that uh, what's the right thing to do over what's the wrong thing to do, that even if our house had a mark, even if our couch had a mark, even our clothes had a mark, even if it had a mark on our body, we still would ignore it until what happens? Less, worst case scenario, you have to go see what? Kohen. Kohen. Nowadays we don't have a Kohen. Sometimes you can go see the rabbi. If you don't see the rabbi, sometimes you have to go see the judge. If you don't see the judge, sometimes they see the police officer. Sometimes it takes you something so dramatic until it shakes you up to understand that you did something wrong. But how do you let it go? How do you, how do you, how do you let it progress? What do you think, Rabbi? Uh, what do you think? Would a per, why would a person let it escalate? I don't have a chidush. I'm just thinking out loud. Then later on, what we do is we put them in uh, exclusion. We quarantine him. He's by himself. Because the same way he caused people to get distant from one another, he's going to feel the same way by being distanced from them, being all on his own so he can... Uh, think about his uh, actions, then you can think about his uh, um, uh, the, the effect of being isolated in, in society and out of the community. But you can see that this is something very, very interesting. How much a Lashon Hara, a Motsi Lashon Ra about somebody else, all the things that, it taught, that, the, that the Torah gave us a whole parasha about it, close to one and a half. Not only that, once he's completely done, what does he look like after? What does he look like? He's shaved completely. Every hair in his body. Every hair in his body. His head, his eyebrows, his beard, everything, is his bodily hairs. Could you imagine that even after he's gone through the entire process, as he's walking in the street, what a busha, because everybody's pointing at him saying, look, look at this guy. This guy was probably a motzi lashonah about somebody. Look how he's looking right now. You know, people look very, very weird without eyebrows. You don't notice them until you see it. Certain people, when they look, if you ever see a person, you know, there's some cultures that do it. But a person without eyebrows and without hair, they look strange. They stand out. We're not used to seeing people like that. It's a good one. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that it's very, very interesting is the job of a Kohen. The job of a Kohen, if you think about it, this is not a regular nine to five. The Kohen, he wakes up in the morning, he's got interesting things to do. He's got korbanot, he's got Jewish souls he has to deal with, he has to have kavanot, he has to have ceremonies, he has to deal with people that are, uh, that are dealing with a shonara, all of a sudden with supernatural leprosy on walls, on clothes, on couches. Type on my house this when I come in to check it, please. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? They were really uh, servicers of the community. They met. Unbelievable. The Kohanim. Not only that, they are the descendants of Aaron Kohen. Ohev Shalom, Rodef Shalom. That means even when they're not in Beit Hamikdash, when they're not in the Mishkan, what are they doing? They're following the, 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 the footsteps of their rabbi. What's their rabbi do? What's their father, grandfather, great grandfather, the, the first Kohen do? Or have shalom, or have shalom, and they're going to making shalom between Am Yisrael. What will we do without the Kohen then? And what will we do without the Kohen now? One last thing about the Kohanim, and then we'll turn the Hidushim to, uh, to you guys. Last week, it was Aharon Kohen's first Birkat Kohanim. First. It was the first Birkat Kohanim. And it was during the time of the Mishkan. And we have to understand also that the Birkat Kohanim is not that the Kohen is blessing us. Hashem is. The Bercha of Hashem is coming through the Kohen. You have to remember that all the time. When the big Kohen, when the Kohen gets up and does the Birkat Kohanim, we give him the honor that he's a Kohen. 
you know, we bring him to a Brit Milah, do, do Birkat Kohanim on the baby, but it's not because of him. Just understand that Hashem used yeah. him as the vessel, as the vessel to pass the Bracha through him. Because we can't get it direct from Hashem. We need a conduit, something in between. And that's, that was a Birkat Kohanim. This is just a little bit of a... Uh, um, you know, understanding a little bit more about uh, the Kohanim and their job. Ilan, you said you had a Chidush? Adam, okay, let's see your title. No, I, I have this, I can do this. I want to go last. Okay. No? You go. Uh, I'm not ready. Go. Rabbi? Um... You brought up a tremendous point about why does it take so long for this guy to change his mind? And it put me to think. And I, I realize um, there's like three categories here. The first is his house. Or maybe it's not first, maybe first is his uh, clothing, some of the clothing. No, I thought it was stuff. house, I think so too. furniture, clothing, then him. Right, right. Um, needless to say, the house is the biggest loss. It's a tremendous loss. Because it has to get destroyed. What's, or the, down. what's the deal with the with going on then to the to the clothing and to 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 the furniture, the clothing? That's that's peanuts. What's that going to help so much? He already lost his house. Okay, and then it goes to his body. But I think the the the, the reason why the house maybe is, doesn't work as well is because. You remember when we do Hanukkah to buy by a person, we read a piece of the Zohar. And there we we read about this, about the the, the stones and the, and the Hashem gives it Sarat and so far. So Rashi brings down in this week's parasha that one of the reasons Hashem would do this is not necessarily because there was a Sarat in the house, really there was a sin. But he wanted them to find treasures that were hidden by the... That was in the capturing of... Uh, that was in, during the time of Mitzrayim, we had something like that. No, no, then it was in the capturing no, no, of Eretz Yisrael. Right, so, so, so it's, it's, Hashem is like almost telling you, because it says, Venatati, I'm going to do it. He's like telling you, he doesn't say, if you guys this, I'll put it, but it says, I'm going to do it. So why is it like uh, for sure? So Rashi, so Rashi brings the Midrash that because they, they hid a lot of treasures here and there, so Hashem does that, so you have to tear down the wall in that particular place, and the next thing you know is you, you find the treasure. So it's a chesed hidden behind the din. Right, so, so, so here the person, uh, you know, he's, he, he's not sure what's going on. Now, and then there's another reason, then the Zohar says another reason, uh, that it's because sometimes you would take over a home, from, from a Canaanite, and that home had tremendous Tuma in it. It was built with Tuma. He used to say, oh, sh names of Abu Zara and so far when he built it, and it's not good for you. So Hashem would either eventually break down the whole place or whatever. So it comes out that when the house comes down completely, you're not 100% sure why it's coming down. Maybe it is the Lashon Arra, maybe not, maybe it's something else. Then it starts on your clothing. Yeah, you're right, that should be the wake-up call. More of a... It's more a personal, connected yeah, it's getting right good. on you already. Now, the, the, that one doesn't work. Then it goes on a whole different level, it's yourself. Why is it when your clothing, when it hits your clothing, you don't tell them, go out of the camp for seven days? It's only when it hits his own person, his own body. To save him from busha? Because the clothing could still cover, yes, you could still it take cover off. Yes, it can cover up, you're right, you're right. There's, an eighth, there's, there's a process for koshering the clothes. I think in this chumash, in this chumash, in this chumash, there's a, a graph of the clothing. Here, let me flip through it. Which, which parasha? Tazria. There's a whole graph of, here, there, there it is. Look at that, Rabbi. Look at the talich of just the clothing. You have to, you have to kosher clothes. Um, and or destroy it. And, 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 and why? Uh, 
Why does it tell us to bring a bird to the corn? But it has to be, it can be tummy, it has to be like, it can, I mean, it can be like injured, it has to be like kosher, and it has to be like, uh, like not injured. They're anyway gonna do it, like, they're anyway gonna like kill it or anything. So why are they giving it? Why are they not bringing, why are they not bringing injured? What do you mean, an injured bird? Yeah, that, like. I think you can't bring anything with a moon as a korban. So that's a problem here, is to, um, You can't bring anything with a moon in a korban. Um, so to finish your point, Rabbi? So, I, I don't know, but the, the, the final one is that the only way he can do tshuva, you see, is, you know, is if it does nothing hits him, is when he's completely secluded within himself, he's separated from everything, I guess. Soul searching. The, the, that's a nice point. Is he permitted to keep his cell phone when he's out there for seven days? Mm -hmm. No, it's supposed to be excommunicated from uh, society. So when he's all by himself and he's got this injury that he sees every day. All he day, can do is think about it. That's the, that's the final uh, thing that finally, you know, changes him. He can't go back to the camp till he changes. Because it's not going to go away. They're going so basically if he doesn't change, it stays on him and it stays on him. Yeah. I mean, there's a process, but this is the final one, you see. But it's interesting to see. It's only when he hits your body, number one. It hits you more and more there, not your property. It's you, yourself, and I. Me, myself, and I. So you can say sometimes a person loke bimamono. And then sometimes actually loke al besaro, he doesn't understand. Maybe you can not say like that. Okay, let's hear from you, Yonatan. So I want to see a story of, uh, of the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there was a guy back then that um, didn't pay taxes and he had to go to court so he, he was like he was like a religious man and he the court told him he had to pay like thousands of dollars in taxes and he didn't have that money so they gave him a, a new court date and it was like two months from the next court date and the wife tells his husband to go to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the guy s starts saying what do you mean I need to waste a thousand dollars now in taxes how what do you mean I have to go? I don't have money to pay for this. His wife, like, you should still go, don't worry. So he kept on bugging him. And at the end, he's like, you know what? I'll go. So he went to the, the Lubavitcher River. Excuse and me. Do you know this story was here in the U.S. or in Russia? I'm not sure. In, in Russia, I think. Okay. I guess. And, um, the... Rebbe sends him to a dentist. So he goes back home and he's thinking to himself, a dentist? What am I gonna do in a dentist? My teeth are perfect. I don't need to go to no dentist. It's a waste of money anyways. So he tells his wife. So he sent me to, uh, to a dentist and he's not going. So his wife said, because he told you to go, you should go. And he said, no, you know, I'm not gonna go because this and that. He's like, she's like, go, you need to go if he send you. So again, she she bugged him and he said, all right. So he, when he went there, he spoke he spoke to the dentist. He to, The dentist asked for the story and he told the dentist the story. So the dentist said, okay, come, come back tomorrow. So he's so mad, he was like, Oh my God, it's wasting my time. So anyways, he goes back the next day and the walls were so thin that he can hear the dentist talking to some guy. So he's telling him the story. He's, he's telling some guy's story, his story. And he, he wants to like go in the room and like kill them both. But he said, you know what, I'll just wait. So they call him in, he goes in, 
And then the, the, the guy said, why are you telling my story to everyone? It's supposed to be private. So the dentist left, and he brought in the guy that was in there. And the guy said, when is your court date? And this guy said that it was like uh, a day, some kind of day. And the guy said, well, that day I'm the judge. So I'll fix you. But I didn't see you, I didn't meet you, I don't know who you are, nothing. The day of the court, well, I'll help you and make sure you get through this. And who was this, the rabbi? The previous Lubavitcher rabbi told him to go to the dentist and... Nice, mm -hmm. yes. Sounds like a Russian story. I mean, you know, since we're talking about uh, stories about the Lubavitcher rabbi, I'll tell you about uh, a beautiful story that I heard last month. <clears throat> there was a couple that was getting married. And you know, the Shiduchim, they happen very quickly. And uh, they decided that before they go to get married, this couple, they go to the rabbi for a blessing. And when they get, went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, the lady asked to speak to him in private. And she did. But she spoke to him for about 40 minutes. When she came out, uh, you know, her fiancé or her soon-to-be husband was waiting outside. And, you know, he didn't want to ask her because they weren't really very close yet. They were just like dating, you can say. Or it was the pro in the process of a shiduch. And, uh, and they ended up getting married. Right after they got married, there's a process called the uh, Yichud Room. Yichud Room is the one the yeah, you go by yeah, yeah, the husband... Yeah, the, the, the married couple finally get to be together in a room and they share a special moment and they say, you know, like, they talk about the ceremony and, you know, they have like just a, a private moment before they're bombarded by hundreds of people again. So as soon as they get to the Yichud Room, the husband asks her, her, now her husband asks her, I have to ask you a question. What... Did you and the Lubavitcher Rebbe speak about for 40 minutes? So she goes, I can't lie, but I asked him about you. I told him that I didn't want to marry you because I thought that you had a temper and you're probably a very angry person and I don't know if this is a good shidduch. So the guy was shocked and he tells her, he tells her, uh, he tells her, so what did the rabbi say? He says, well, Be'ezat Hashem, you guys will have a lot of children, and your children will teach you a lot of patience, and you'll, be, you'll have a successful marriage. And because the rabbi told me to marry you, I married you. This is a munat chachamim, by the way, that the woman can go against her instinct, because the rabbi said, she said. So anyways, they got married. A few months later, she's trying to conceive, and they're not having children. Maybe very apropos for Ishaki Tazria. And she wasn't able to conceive. And uh, she goes to a, to a gynecologist, to a woman doctor. And he tells her, sit down after checking her. He says, sit down, I have to tell you something. I know you come from an orthodox uh, tradition. Or, uh, and I know how it is in, the, in Jewish culture. And I want you to sit down. I want to tell you something very, very serious. You're never going to ha be able to have children. You have an infantile womb. You have a womb that's never been developed. It's a womb of a, of a little girl. And you, you don't have the parts to bear children. Well, she came out of that doctor's office completely devastated. And she felt like completely crushed. But then when they got home, she said, but the rabbi said that... We will have children, and from there, we will learn how to have patience with one another. To make a long story short, that particular lady ended up getting pregnant. Ended up having oh, I heard the story. 15 children. Yeah. And when she was 43, 44, she goes to, the, goes to uh, I don't know if it was the same doctor, but the same type of doctor again. And at 44 years old, he tells her, I need to speak to you. This is something very serious. I want you to come into my office. He sits her down, goes to her after taking a lot of tests and uh, taking a lot of x-rays. It seems to me that you're never gonna be able to bear children. 
and shows that you have an infantile womb. She goes to him, okay, thank you very much. She comes out of the office laughing, already have 15 kids. <laughs> goes to show you that after all those years and after all those years, she didn't have the body parts. Mamash miracle. Mamash miracle in her, in her emuna. And what her Rebbe told her is all she needed in order to continue in life wow. with, with having children. And not just once, not just twice, not just 15 times. True story, this couple lives in Miami Beach. They live on 41st. They're still alive. Whoa. This is a super recent story. This is not from ancient history. I don't. It's a video that I saw on Facebook one of these days. Somebody passed on to me. And I was very impressed with that story. Very, very impressed. Wow. Because the, the chidush here is not that the, there was a miracle of the baby or the amount of babies. That was no there was no womb. There was no womb. Yeah, Vesara, she was uh, Elonit. Elonit. She didn't have those parts. So you can see that Shaki uh, Tazriam, sometimes it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the miracle of life happens sometimes in many different ways. All in the, it's all in the hands of Kadosh Baruch Hu. It all depends if you have a Muna or not. Since we're talking on Shaki Tazriam, I'll give you one more story about children. There was a girl in Israel that was having a very hard time to have children. And uh, she said, there's a special rabbi in Bnei Brak. You go to him, he gives you a bracha, you get pregnant. So finally, they get on this list, something like uh, maybe two, two or three months, they finally got uh, the appointment to, have, uh, to see the rabbi. And as soon as they see the rabbi, they come to him, they tell him the story, Rabbi, it's been so many years, we're trying to conceive, it's not happening, please give us a bracha. The rabbi tells him, okay, no problem, I'll give you a bracha, 50,000 shekel. 50,000 shekel, Rabbi, I only make 6,000 shekel a month, I don't even have any savings, how am I going to give you 50,000 shekel? He goes, to listen to me, 50,000 shekels, I give you the bracha, you have a child. They walk out of the office like, this is the rabbi that everybody's talking about? What is this, a business? Anyways, they were so desperate to have a child, so desperate, they went and they scratched and they aunts, uncles, parents, this, that, they come back to him after three and a half weeks and they tell them, Rabbi, we came up with 31,000 shekels. It was very, very hard for us. Please, give us the bracha to have a child. The Rabbi takes the 31,000, puts it on the desk, he says, no, 50,000 shekel. So the husband gets up and says, What is this? What do you think? You're controlling things? Only Hashem controls everything. Only Hashem can decide if you're going to, if you're going to have a child or what. What are you making a business over here? 31,000, 51,000? The rabbi gets up and says, Now you understand. Now you got to the point. Now you know that only Hashem is the one that can give you the beracha. He gave them back the money. Give them the beracha, and that year they became, uh, she conceived a child. Why? Because they had to get to that point, that the beracha is from Hashem. The rabbi used that tactic just to bring him to that emunah, to that belief. Sometimes, you know, the, the rabbis are so smart, about Hashem, that they knew exactly which angle in order to get that guy uh, to that point. I want to say another story. Um, so, there was like a, a family, like, no,
you know I never ate non kosher meat. And the father is like, well, eat it anyways. You're going to have babies. She's like, I can't do that. That's not kosher. So, like, the argument went on, and she didn't touch the food. So they leave. And then after a few months, she gets pregnant. Yeah. The father was very angry at her. Baruch Hashem, because that's... Only because he mentioned an Arab. I'll tell you one more story. This is from my aunt. My aunt used to live in a moshav. And one of her best friends was an Israeli Arab. They were very good friends. They were over each other's homes. They did picnics together, barbecues together, holidays together. True, true, true friends. And this Arab c couple could not bear children. And they heard about Baba Sali. And this Arab woman heard about Baba Sali. And she says, I want to go get a blessing from Baba Sali. So she says, okay, let's go to Netivot. And let's see what happens. So my aunt goes to, to Netivot with her. She goes and meets with Baba Sali's wife. And she tells her, listen, I have a good friend of mine. She's an Arab. She's a good Arab. She's pregnant. Please, the, we, we need to, you know, can the rabbi bless her to have children? So his wife tells him, listen, the rabbi is not going to give a blessing to an Arab. It's not going to happen. What are we going to do? She goes, ah, busha, chuma, what's going to happen? She came all the way from over here. What are we going to do? She goes, listen, I don't know what to tell you, but it's not going to... It's not going to happen. The rabbi is not going to, to bless her. So what, what did my aunt do? She went to the back. She filled up an empty bottle of Coca-Cola with the water from the hose from the backyard. She took the bottle and gave it to everyone. She said, drink this. Every morning before you, you do anything, take a glass from here and drink it. And don't let it, don't let it go down. Every time that it goes to the mouth, fill it back up. Make a long story short, she had such an emunah, she had such a belief that this was from the rabbi and a blessing from the rabbi. She got pregnant that year after 15 years of being barren. Oh my gosh. And, there's a, and every year she does a hilula for Baba Sali. There's Arabs in Israel that do a hilula for Baba Sali every single year. They're big. I'm talking about they do it all out. And they're not Jewish. Wow. And this is my aunt's friend from the from Moshev Klachim. Now, was she an Arab or a... Uh, Druze. Druze. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Who knows? But it goes to show you, emunat chachamim, when you believe... I, I'll give you one, you know, since we're now over summer study, we went from Isha Ketazia to, uh, to stories. One... I just have a bite. Eh? I just have a bite. Is that a Yeah. I אשתי אחרי שאדם נולד, אמרה לי, לא, אני רוצה קצת חופש שלוש שנים וזה. ניסינו, ניסינו, אין. כלום לא עזר. אז אני הייתי עוזר לרב שמיא, הייתי לוקח אותו בזוזות, לחבר שלי בסנרי. אז יום אחד הרב אמר, תגיד לי, אני יכול לעשות לך בבית, אני רוצה את המזוזות שלך, שאני גר בפרוי? אמרתי לו, תשמע, הרב שם לי את זה פה, תבדוק, אני מסתכל, מסתכל, אומר, טוב, המזוזה הזאת לא במקום אנחנו. של הכניסה, למה? אני יודע, אתה יודע, אתה יודע, אתה יודע, אתה יודע, אמרתי לו, זה קצת על הדפנה של החלום. טוב, נזיז לי אותה, אחרי כמה חודשים, יש לי את זה. והיא עשתה שיעורי תורה, והיא עשתה הכל, כלום. הוא הזיז את המזוזה, יש לי את זה קטע לא, על האדם, הלא. הוא היה... תבין למה אני צריך להזיז אותך שם. ויש לי עוד דבר קטן על התזריע. תזריע, אבל אומרים שאם שאתה תזריע, תקבל בן. אז העניין של תזריע זה עניין שאישה צריכה לשמור מידה כמו שצריך ואז הראשי תאומות של תזריע זה תקדש זיווגה ורצון השם עשתה ואז נכון אחרי זה הוא אומר לה ואז נכון הוא אומר בעיתו הרי בעיתו מה זה אומר אומרים חז"ל שזה בעיתו זה שבת הרי כשגשמים יבוא עם בעיטם זה בשבת ואומרים גם שבילדה זכר והגימטר של זכר זה ברכה, וגשמים הרי זה ברכה, ועדיף שיעשו את זה בשבת, כאילו את העניין הזה של ה... ואז אין להם את הבן. חזק. חזק. כל הכבוד.
Sometimes I like to tell the stories that are very recent. I give another very recent story. <clears throat> Less than six months ago, a member of my extended family had a stroke. And it was a very scary, it was a very scary event. And the gentleman, when he went to the, hus- to the hospital, they did all the CT scans, all the, all the MRIs, everything that they had to do, and they found something. They found something. And he was very, very depressed about it. And not more than three or four days after, he had to go back to, for a second, second follow-up, check-up, different doctors. In between that, again, this is just a few months ago. In between that, he calls up his family rabbi. It's a rabbi that's, uh, he's the son of his brothers. Uh, you know, like, a, that's the family's rabbi. Everything that has to do with, uh, with that family, they turn to this particular rabbi. And he tells him the situation. The rabbi, Melhon Lehon, tells him, you have nothing. He goes to the rabbi, give me a bracha. He goes to my, why should I give you a bracha? He goes, you have nothing. He says, I saw the picture. I saw the thing. There's something over there. Give me a bracha. He goes, I'll give you a bracha, but you have nothing. He goes to him, how come... Uh, so, he goes, he gives him the bracha. And, you know, he took the bracha to heart. And he went to the meeting. He went to the doctor. The doctor comes, they take the thing, they had to take the pictures twice, three times, MRI scans, all this. Nothing there. Nothing there. So he goes back to the rabbi and goes to him, I want to know how you know. How did you know that there's nothing there? I, I have the pictures right now in my hand, I'm looking at it, that there's something there. Today I go back, there's nothing. He goes, the rabbi tells him something very interesting. He goes, you know who made the beracha work? He says, you made the beracha work. You made everything go away. He says, why? He says, if you believe, the beracha works. If you don't believe, it's never going to work. He says, I say the same beracha that I gave you, maybe a hundred times a week. How come for you it works and for 80 it doesn't? How come it doesn't work 100% down the board for everybody? He says, the berachot of the rabbis work only for the guy that has the emunah and he believes in he says, we're just saying words. We're nothing. What are we? The rabbis are uh, just like, they're, 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 they're like a vessel. They're using the words. He says, the way that the bracha gets activated into a Yeshua is when you have emunah in a kadosh baruch Hu, and, the, and, and you believe in such, you have such an emunah that the rabbi is just the one that's giving you the, uh, the message. So imagine, we have such Yeshua. It it's all depends time, in the Santa Fe. Believe, it depends in the emunah. יש גם סיפור של הרבה, הרי היה, הרבה כל, כל הזמן היה הולך להתפלל, הוא היה הולך לציון של הרבה, של האדמו"ר הרייט. אז, אתה יודע, כשהוא היה הולך, אז לכל הזמן היה לו ליווי משטרתי. אז השוטר שכל הזמן היה מלווה אותו, לא היה לו ילדים. אז הוא אמר לו, הוא הלך למזכיר של הרבה, הוא תגיד לי, הרבה יכול לברך גם אותי, שיהיה לי ילדים? אז הוא אמר לו, בטח, הרבה זה הרבה של כולם. הוא הלך וביקש ברכה. ונולד לו בן, ולילד הזה קוראים מנחם מנדל, אם אני זוכר, אנחנו זה השם שלו, מנחם מנדל. מנחם מנדל. והוא מראה את הדרכון שלו והכל, את העדי שלו. השוטר הכושי. השוטר, כן. ורשום לו מנחם מנדל. ורשום לו השם של הרבי. That we always have Emunat Chachamim and will merit to hear Yeshuaot, Brachot, Vatzlachot, and that we feel Hashem's Yeshua in our lives and always remember Yeshuaot Hashem, Kehere Fine. Anything can change in a split second. Shavuatov.